Hello, and welcome to this, the fourth and final installment in the 2021 Virtual Biotech 101 series. My name is Neil Lamb, and I am your host uh, for this episode. Thank you for joining me. You are watching this from the comfort of your home, or maybe a coffee shop, or maybe out in a park somewhere. I'm here in the Cleary Library on the Probst, in the Probst building on the Hudson Alpha campus. And tonight's topic, COVID-19, is the entire reason why we're doing this as a virtual episode. We have a whole lot of content to cover in a short period of time. So why don't we go on ahead and get started? Make yourself comfortable, settle in, grab a beverage, maybe a cookie or a snack. Let me start by once again thanking our presenting sponsor, Twickingham Advisors. Uh, without their support, we wouldn't be able to offer this uh, as a free service to, uh, to the folks that enjoy Biotech 101. So thank you, Twickingham Advisors. I'm deeply appreciative of your support. I also want to thank the Jackson Center, an ongoing sponsor. I'm hopeful that the next time we have Biotech 101, we'll be able to gather in the Jackson Center together with those fantastic cookies. And I want to thank the Hudson Alpha Alumni Association. Now, as of tonight, all of you watching become Biotech 101 graduates. So congratulations. Uh, you can move the invisible tassel, uh, and you are now official graduates, which means you're eligible to participate in Biotech 201, which we offer every February. And you also are eligible to become a member of the Hudson Alpha Alumni Association. This is a group of individuals that financially support the work of Hudson Alpha's education program, specifically our Biotech 101 and 201 programs. Uh, there are special activities just for alumni association members that are scheduled throughout the year. You'll receive some information uh, by email in the coming days about the alumni association with an opportunity to participate if you would so choose. So let's dive right in. COVID-19. This is the content that we're going to cover, and we're going to move through this pretty quickly. Some of this you may be really familiar with. Some of this may be new to you. A lot of things have happened in the field over the last several weeks, and we're going to make sure that we cover that, especially as it relates to the, to the variants and to vaccines and to boosters. But there are some other new pieces along the way that you might not be so familiar with. Now, here's an important disclaimer. I am a human geneticist and I am a science communicator and educator who spent a lot of time during the pandemic studying COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus and then communicating that back out to the public. But I am not an epidemiologist or an infectious disease expert or a public health policy leader or a physician. So I want you to take what you're hearing from me with that pretty significant disclaimer. There are many more people that know much more than me about this. I'm looking at what they have said and putting that together to share to you, share with you, but I am not the person for the, the high-end, really challenging uh, policy questions. I have put together a series of short videos called Beyond the Blog. These are all six to eight to nine minute videos. There's 71 of them. We started right after the pandemic hit in March of 2020. Uh, and you can find these uh, on the Hudson Alpha uh, website. If you just search Hudson Alpha Beyond the Blog, that'll take you to them. They cover a lot of the content that we're going to talk about tonight. So I'm going to start with where do we currently stand? So there are a number of different websites you can go to to track the frequency of cases, uh, new cases, hospitalizations, deaths in your specific area. One of my favorite ones is COVID Act Now. I'm actually showing you the data from three different locations. The green line is the Huntsville metro area. That's where many of our viewers live. That's Madison County and Limestone County. The orange line is the state of Alabama, and the blue line is the United States. And this particular graph is showing you the average daily rate of new cases since the very beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020, all the way through here we are at the end of September. And you can see the initial wave and then you can see the big wave that we had back at the last, hol the last holiday season, the beginning of the year, and then the wave that we are currently in. 
Now, this is uh, referenced for uh, one, per 100,000 individuals. So there is a way to, to um, equalize this out, to normalize this as you're looking at groups with broadly different populations. But you can see we are on the downside, at least here in Alabama, from this most recent wave driven primarily by the Delta variant. And we'll dig into that a little bit more. This is hospitalization, specifically in Alabama, from the Alabama Department of Public Health website. And you can see we are also beginning to trend down there, although we are still at really high numbers compared to where we typically would be. Hospital ICUs are still full. There are still sometimes shortages with beds, but we're beginning to come down from those uh, most recent peaks. And then we also need to talk just a little bit about the serious toll that COVID has taken. So this is also from the Alabama Department of Public Health website. This is the death rate. And in Alabama, since the beginning of the pandemic, about 14,000 individuals have died from COVID. Across the country, that number is about 650, 660,000 individuals who have passed away uh, from COVID-19. Now, it's important to note that the data that are at the end within the last two weeks, regardless of what site you look at, when you're looking at data around death, there's always a window, about a two week, two to three week window where the data are incomplete. So you wanna take what you see at the end of the graph with a bit of a grain of salt because it takes a while for data on death records to come back to the departments of public health and the other reporting agencies. Now, let's shift gears. Let's start with the first of the background pieces. Let's talk about how the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, let's talk about how that virus is actually transmitted. And if you think back to the spring of 2020, when we were first learning about COVID-19, there was a lot of concern about COVID-19, about the virus living on surfaces and washing your groceries and setting things outside when you got packages so that the virus would, would die before you brought it in and touched it. Hand hygiene. Washing your hands is important. That's because your hands often un uh, with you not even being aware of it, touch your mouth or your eyes or your nose. So you could pick up the virus, you could pick up the virus from yourself and spread it to others. So it's still important to wash your hands. But this concern about what's called fomite transmission, which is infection that you've picked up from a surface is much less of a concern. In fact, it's relatively, it's, it's actually pretty rare. So that leaves us with two other ways that the virus is transmitted. And some of this, again, you have, we've been talking about this for months. The first is through droplet transmission. So remember, this is a, a virus that lives in your upper airways, at least initially. That's where, that's where it takes up residence. And so every time you cough or breathe or speak or sing or yell, you are, if you are infected, you are breathing out infectious particles. A lot of those are in liquid droplets that are five microns or larger. And those travel, you know, somewhere between three and four feet and then gravity takes hold and they fall to the ground. So that's, the, that's part of why distancing becomes so important. This is a big piece of why, part of why we wear masks and why we think about spacing people out. But as we've gone through the pandemic, we've also recognized that there are even smaller droplet size, particles that are less than five microns. And just for comparison, the diameter of a human hair is 60 to 20 microns wide. So we're talking about something that is incredibly small, much, much, much smaller than the diameter of the hairs on your head. Those tiny infectious particles travel much further than three to four feet, and they can remain in the air for several minutes or even hours, especially if you're in a place where there isn't a lot of ventilation that's moving, that's exchanging the air with the outside. So this is when we talk about airborne transmission. And there are a lot of people that, that have heard airborne transmission and have, have really worried about what that meant. Scientists have argued about the specific definition. But essentially, this is the reason why you want, to be in, be, you want to stay away from spaces that are crowded with lots of people that are indoors without good ventilation. This is why we talk about opening doors and windows and why we talk about um, air purifiers in certain settings, because you're concerned not only about the larger droplets, but also the smaller droplets that can contain active virus that you can then inhale and can take up residence inside. 
The other thing that's been really interesting, or another thing that's been interesting about this virus, about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, is the way that people transmit or don't transmit. So let's start with this individual right here in red. This individual infected 16 other people with SARS-CoV-2. And those are represented by these yellow circles. Most of those individuals didn't go on to infect anybody or maybe one or two people. And then this individual infected a person who went on to infect 11 others. So the spreading pattern is really variable from person to person. Most people don't infect a lot of individuals. Some people are super spreaders. And it's that combination of super spreaders coming into close contact with people in indoor places where everybody is near each other that you really worry about. That's the way that you infect lots of people rapidly. That's especially important as we learn more about the Delta variant, which produces a higher amount of virus particles in the people that are infected. So they are breathing out, talking out, singing out more infectious particles. And those infectious particles are more easily able to infect other individuals. They are, they are, there's a higher level of, of contagiousness and infectiousness. In a nutshell, we're not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but let's walk through what happens when the SARS-CoV-2 virus infects a human cell. By now you are all familiar with the fact that the outside of the virus has all of these spike proteins on them. And each one of these is actually three spike proteins all put together. Um, and that, that triad is what actually makes connection with proteins on the outside of our cell and begins that binding or that docking process. So here at the top, here is a, uh, a SARS-CoV-2 virus with the spike proteins shown here in blue and the RNA, the genetic code of the virus in orange. These are RNA viruses. They don't contain DNA. They do everything by RNA. And it binds to proteins here on the surface of the human cell and it docks. And then it essentially, the proteins on the surface of the cell pull it in and open it up. And that injects the RNA material into the human cell. And so once the virus's RNA is in the human cell, it does a couple of things. It hijacks the cell's machinery. So instead of the cell making copies of, uh, making human proteins, it makes viral proteins. It uses the RNA recipe of the virus to make the specific spike proteins and the membrane proteins that the virus needs. And then it also makes thousands and thousands of copies of the virus RNA genome. So we've essentially turned the cells into giant virus making machines. And then those proteins that sit on the outside surface and the membrane are packaged together with the virus RNA, giving us complete, uh, fully functional virus particles. And then there's a final cut that is made on some of the, um, the spike proteins. Um, it's called the furin cleavage site. And that cleavage site actually allows this virus to infect other cells even more effectively. Some of the variants of the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, have mutations that make this furin site work even better. So that means that those variants are even more effective at infecting other cells. And then the virus particles are um, exported out to the outside of the cell where they can then go on to infect cells around them. We are coming up on a question break. So if you've got some questions that you want to ask, go ahead and type them into the chat uh, and those will be passed up to me. Now, in many, many cases, the SARS-CoV-2 virus creates a really mild set of symptoms. In fact, in some cases, people are asymptomatic. They don't even know that they are infected, but they're capable of infecting others. And then in a lot of people, they just feel bad, like a, a bad cold, or they may be really achy. But there are other individuals where the virus infection is much more than just a series of aches and chills and feeling under the weather and having a fever and staying in bed for a few days. There are multiple different parts of our body 
that the SARS-CoV-2 virus can attack and can cause significant damage. From huge issues in the lungs where the lungs fill up with fluid um, and it becomes really challenging for individuals to breathe, to blood clots uh, and strokes, um, to, to issues with, uh, with the loss of taste and smell, uh, problems with the liver and the kidneys, damage to other organs. So while for some people this is not a big deal, for others it causes serious significant harm. And in general, the older you are, especially individuals that are over the age of 50, the greater the risk of more serious side effects. And if you have a set of comorbidities, those are things like uh, if you uh, have diabetes or if you um, if you have issues with blood pressure or if you have obesity um, or if you're immunocompromised, then this is a virus that you also are at a greater risk of bigger issues from. Many people, the majority of people, recover in a relatively short time frame. Then there are the individuals that need to go to the hospital that require a longer recovery time. And then there are people that are impacted with what's called long COVID. So this is a set of symptoms associated with COVID that last beyond the typical, you know, three to four week window. Uh, and many of these individuals have muscle fatigue, which you can see on this graph here. Others have challenges uh, sleeping, um, joint pain. Uh, many people lose their sense of smell and taste for an extended window of time. Loss of smell is an early indicator for people of, that they may have COVID. It often comes back uh, within a couple of weeks. I actually have a really good friend who last week got his sense of taste and smell back 250 days after he first contracted COVID. So he's gone months without being able to smell or taste anything. That's an example of long COVID. Early on, I think a lot of physicians weren't so sure if long COVID was a real thing or if people were just, just continuing to, to complain about symptoms. We now know it is a clear clinical set of disorders and it impacts a significant number of people. And then you may have heard about something called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, MISC. This is rare, but it can occur in kids who may have a mild case. They may even be asymptomatic but a few weeks later, they develop inflammation over all parts of their body. And in some cases, these kids actually need to be hospitalized. There are treatments and therapies for this, but it's something that we've been on the watch for, um, even as we know that in general, children are less likely to have serious side effects. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't kids that are hospitalized or even kids that die from COVID. There are, but in general, younger children have some level of Protection may not be the right word. They're more likely to have less severe symptoms. But again, that doesn't mean that you aren't seeing kids with more severe symptoms. It's just something that we have to be aware of. All right, here's our first question break. So I'm gonna check my phone and see if we've got any questions that have come in from you. Ah, here's one from Peter. Oral antiviral agents have not played a therapeutic role so far with COVID-19 infections. Is there some reason that we are not seeing additional antiviral therapy similar to the kind of antiviral therapy that we see for HIV? Peter, great question. We're actually going to cover that, I think, in this, in this next section. But you're right, we have not seen a lot of very successful antivirals. And in fact, many of the candidates that we thought might have been promising antivirals have turned out not to be once we've done larger clinical trials. But I think there are some really promising candidates just on the horizon, which we'll talk about in just a second. All right, keep your questions coming. We'll have a couple more question breaks throughout this session. So how do we defend ourselves against the SARS-CoV-2 virus and against COVID-19? So these are the tools that we have at our disposal. Human behavior is one of the key drivers. Non-pharmaceutical ways, ways that don't involve medications or trips to the hospitals are some of the most powerful ways to reduce the likelihood of us developing COVID-19. And these are the things that you are all familiar with. Wearing masks, keeping distance, practicing good hand hygiene, 
isolating when you are when you have had an exposure, quarantining if you've developed symptoms. We also have ways that we can now test for individuals that are infected. We have a multitude of ways that we can do that kind of testing. We're beginning to build some treatments, not as many as we would like to have. We can survey the progress as the virus evolves, as it gains mutations, and we can try to track that, which gives us some hints of what might be ahead. And then we've got vaccines. And each of these together really comes out as to what's called the Swiss cheese defense mechanism. And if you think about a slice of Swiss cheese, it has holes in it. And each one of these different options, each one of these defensive mechanisms has some level of protection, but it isn't foolproof. It's got holes. But when you stack all of these together, then you drastically decrease the likelihood that you're going to actually get infected and get serious illness. So that's why this combination of things are important. None of them is a magic bullet in and of itself. It's the fact that they all are working together. There are multiple layers of defense between you and the virus. And that's why when we take all of these away and we only rely on vaccines, that's when things become problematic because no vaccine is perfect especially when you deal with things like the Delta variant, uh, which produces so much more uh, viral particles. So think about the Swiss cheese approach as you think about ways to continue to keep yourself safe. Now, let's talk just a little bit about masking. I know that masking has become a hot topic. I don't really understand why it's become such a political hot potato, and we're not gonna go into that. I'll tell you, for me, I look at wearing a mask as the ultimate form of Southern hospitality because I am protecting those around me in case I myself am infectious. I'm also giving some protection to myself as well, but I'm doing this both for those around me, for, for my fellow citizens, as well as for myself. There's been a lot of people that have cherry-picked data that have said masks don't work. Masks only work under these set of circumstances. Over the last few months, we've seen a number of well-designed well case control studies looking at the impact of masking. And the data clearly tell us that masking makes a difference. Masking reduces the risk of catching and spreading the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, we all have different kinds of masks, cloth masks and surgical masks and N95s and KN95s. The data suggest that the cloth mask provides some level of protection, but that typical surgical mask actually provides a better level of protection, especially because it's got the nose piece that you can shape around your nose. And then those N95s and KN95 masks provide the highest level of protection, but those, especially the N95s, require a specialized fitting. And those are really best held for healthcare professionals that need them. But regardless, the mask that's going to provide the best protection for you is one that you wear and one that fits well. One that doesn't have a lot of gaps, one that's not sagging below your nose, one that you don't have to continually keep adjusting. So find a mask in situations where it makes sense to wear a mask, where you're surrounded by a lot of individuals, when you know there's a high occurrence, a high rate of transmission in your community, it makes sense to wear masks. In other instances, it may make a whole lot less sense to wear masks. When you're outdoors, when you're spaced apart, when there's very low transmission in your community, when most of the people around you are vaccinated. Again, no vaccine guarantees that you won't get it, but vaccines give you another layer of protection. So mask where it makes sense, but make sure the mask you're wearing is a mask that fits you well and one that you will, will wear when you actually are asked to put it on. Let's now talk about the ways that we test for SARS-CoV-2. There are three broad types of testing, and I've got them here on the screen. The molecular test is the one that you're probably the most familiar with. It's the one we've had for the longest window of time. This involves uh, generally a nasal swab. Sometimes you can get this from, a, from saliva or from a cough sample, but you're actually looking for the genetic evidence, the RNA, from the, from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So these are generally RT-PCR tests or maybe some other kind of molecular test. 
In general, these are not rapid. There are a small number of them that can give you results in 30 minutes, but most require several hours or even a couple of days. Originally, these used those really long swabs that went way up in your nasal cavity. Many of them now can just swab the inside of your nose. These are the gold standard. They're the most sensitive test. Antigen tests came along a little bit later. An antigen test is a rapid test that's actually measuring, it's looking for specific proteins that are found um, on the outside of the virus. So these are called lateral flow tests. This is the same kind of test that you might have for a rapid strep test. A pregnancy test uses a similar kind of approach looking for specific hormones that are found um, when a woman is pregnant and then having a way to signal that. So the antigen test is quick. You can get answers rapidly, but it is, it is less sensitive than the molecular, the, um, the molecular test. But if you are looking at the antigen test rapidly, like every day or every other day, that drop in sensitivity may be less important because you are making up for it with more frequent testing. We'll talk about antigen tests when we talk about at-home tests in just a second. And then there are antibody tests. This, the antibody test does not tell you if you are actively infected with the virus. The molecular and the antigen test will tell you if you have an active infection. The antibody test actually looks for the presence of your body's immune response to, the, to being infected, and it tells you if you have been infected. Or depending on what type of antibody you're looking for, it tells you if you've built an immune response through a vaccine. So you've got to know what antibody you're looking for and if you're looking to see if you've been naturally infected or if you have vaccine-induced immunity. Most of these tests, you have to go somewhere to have them done. You have to go to a doctor's office. You have to go to a pharmacy. You have to go to a specialty clinic. Increasingly, there's a demand and a request for tests that you can do at home. And here are three tests that are available if you can find them on the shelves at your pharmacy and at your grocery store. And you can see the price point, $24 for two tests, $39 for one test. These prices have dropped a little bit with the announcement from the White House that they're asking, uh, that they're asking retailers to sell these at a reduced price. So maybe this is now $20 for two tests. But I want to show you what you can find with the same kind of test, these lateral flow tests in Europe. So in the United Kingdom, you can get seven of these tests for about $3.50. In many other countries, you can get 14 tests for free. Now, we're not going to get into a conversation about socialized medicine versus the American healthcare system. That's not where I'm trying to go with this. But in other countries, you can cheaply get multiple tests so that every day you could take an antigen test to determine if you are infectious. Yes, they're less sensitive than a PCR test, a molecular test, but if you're doing it every day, that actually all comes out in the wash. There is a huge need in this country for greater access to at-home rapid tests. There are also places you can go to get molecular tests. There are vending machines on the college campuses, for example, but these are generally not the test itself. It's the swab that you then send somewhere to get your test results back. So I can get the, the, the components I need to swab myself or to have someone watch me swab myself. So that's a monitored test, which some workplaces and some other groups require, but I have to send it off to a lab to have the work done. There's a potential at-home molecular test. It's still in development. It hasn't made its way to the marketplace, but it'll have a relatively high price point. So we've got to decide what are the kinds of tests that we want? What are the kinds of tests that we need? And even though we're seeing ourselves on the backside of the Delta wave, that doesn't mean we're not gonna be dealing with other, maybe hopefully smaller waves um, of the virus. So the need for testing doesn't disappear. Let's now talk about treatment. And Peter, this is where we're going to get to your question about the antivirals. So the COVID-19 can really be divided into two different windows of disease. The first is the viral period where the virus is rapidly reproducing in your upper airways and you've got fever and you have sore throat and, and you don't, you've got aches and pains. And there are a set of treatments for that phase. And for many people, 
That is all they have. Their body, their immune system kicks in and they don't go into the second phase. But the second phase is an overactive immune response. And that's where you begin to see the immune system mount a huge and an overactive um, engagement. And that's where you begin to see the lungs fill with fluid and, and people have to be hospitalized. So you're looking at therapies in that first phase, which are different than therapies from that second phase. Things you might give people before they need to come to the hospital to keep them out of the hospital, and things you might give people once they're hospitalized. Monoclonal antibodies have been a huge game changer in the course of this pandemic. These are created in a lab and they mimic the type of antibodies that we know bind and inactivate the SARS-CoV-2 virus in people that have a strong immune response. So you can give an individual monoclonal antibodies when they're early in the infection window and you can short circuit the infection cycle. They're given by IV and they're about $2,100 uh, per person. So this is not an inexpensive treatment and having to go to the hospital to receive the IV has some inconvenience associated. Groups are looking at monoclonal antibodies that can be given in an oral form, in a pill form. We'll have to watch and see how that makes its way through FDA. But this has been a huge benefit. Monoclonal antibodies and, other and these other medicines fall under the category of antiviral. They're designed to stop the virus in its track, to prevent the virus from binding to human cells or to slow the process of it reproducing itself inside the human cells or to prevent uh, newly formed viruses from escaping from human cells. Remdesivir is another one. Remdesivir is generally given once an individual's in the hospital. The data have been kind of mixed on this. Early data said that yes, this reduced hospital stays, this prevented people from getting seriously ill and going on ventilators. We're seeing some data that somewhat make that a little bit murky. So it's not the, the miracle drug that we potentially thought it was. The same is also true of convalescent plasma. This is taking an individual who has recovered from COVID-19 and taking their blood and pulling out the liquid component which contains antibodies. It's a different way of doing something than monoclonal antibodies. Uh, it, it, it's a, a low tech way. And we, again, we've seen mixed data on how effective convalescent plasma actually is. In some cases it may work well, but in other cases it seems to not have the desired effect. We also can talk about corticosteroids like dexamethasone. These are immune suppressants. And this is something you're generally gonna give in the second half. Those individuals that have an overactive immune response, you're trying to suppress down the immune system. Dexamethasone has been a real benefit in, um, in reducing individuals' progression to serious illness, reducing the length of hospital stays, keeping people off of ventilators. And, and then you've got medicines like blood thinners. I told you that COVID often causes clots and those clots can damage organs. They can cause strokes and heart attacks. So in many, people, many cases, they give blood thinners to try to reduce the frequency of those of those clots. Now, we've seen lots of data around this treatment works, that treatment doesn't work. We've had people, you know, we've, we've learned a lot about hydroxychloroquine. That was a drug that people thought might be a really effective antiviral for SARS-CoV-2 because it's an effective antiviral for other things. We saw lots of data. You could cherry pick out this paper that said it worked and this paper that said it didn't. Part of the challenge in the middle of a pandemic is that everybody doesn't use the same set of guidelines for how they set up a study, how they select the patients that are going to be in the study, the doses that they give, the timing that they give, and they may use really small numbers of patients. So we saw lots of papers come out that said that there was a great benefit, but they were looking at 15 or 20 people and they were not all using the same guidelines. And then when you did larger studies with thousands of individuals where you carefully controlled who got the medication and what dose, you saw that things like hydroxychloroquine didn't work. We're seeing the same sort of thing with, uh, with ivermectin, which is, another, which is an anti-parasitic medication. There may be some benefit, but we need larger studies to tell us that. But in the meantime, people are looking for quick, simple at-home fixes. And so they go to their veterinarian and they get uh, ivermectin, which is often given to deworm uh, horses and they have toxic side effects from that. So I, I just wanna encourage you, a single point 
does not make a straight line. You need multiple pieces of data to be able to say, yes, this actually works. This makes a difference and here's the right way to do that. We rush to try to find answers and we often are looking for the quick, easy fix that doesn't require me to have to go into the hospital or I'm suspicious of the scientist that's giving me this data so I'm gonna trust the person on Facebook that is telling me about this. I just want us to be incredibly careful and to follow the science around this. One piece of science that I'm really excited about is a set of clinical trials that are being carried out right now on three different antivirals in pill form. So these are pills that an individual could take after they've been exposed or potentially, well, they could, they could take after they've tested positive and potentially after they've been exposed as a preventative. We should be seeing the results of these really large clinical trials within the next probably three to four weeks. And if any of them work, we now have an incredibly powerful new tool to put in our arsenal. All right, there's our treatment section. We're going to be coming up on a break for questions in just a, a couple of minutes. So if you've got questions, go on ahead and add them to the chat. Let's now talk about sequencing of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is not molecular testing to say, do you have the virus? That's looking at a small piece of the genetic information. This is actually looking at all of the RNA, every single one of the 30,000 plus letters in that recipe book of SARS-CoV-2, looking at each one and saying, are there specific changes that we haven't seen before? Or does this set of changes belong to a set of variants that we've already seen in other places. It's a way to track the spread of how the virus changes and evolves. All viruses over time undergo mutation. If you copied your genome as many times as a virus does, you would have some mistakes. Just like we talked about in our other, other episodes, some of those mistakes are completely silent. They make no difference at all. Other changes have clinical outcomes or have important outcomes. They may make the virus more or less able to infect its host, or they may increase or decrease the amount of virus that is produced, or they may cause more serious or less serious side effects. So that's what you want to track. That's why surveillance becomes so important, that you have a global network of labs that are looking at a small sample of those positive cases and saying, what's the specific sequence of the virus that caused that? And how does that compare to what I've seen elsewhere? Now, I'm about to break my cardinal rule of not putting too many things on a slide. These next two slides are horrifically busy, but I wanted you to have them if you wanted to dig deeper into them. This is from the World Health Organization, the WHO, their classification of the specific types of variants. They have three broad classifications, variant um, of concern, variant of interest, and variant under monitoring. For variants of concern, and you can see here's the definition, these are variants where we know that these specific versions of the virus um, have a higher rate of spread, they may have a different clinical outcome, and they are moving rapidly through a population and we are actively watching and tracking them because there is some important outcome. You're familiar with all of these. Uh, back early in the spring, the World Health Organization decided that they would name them using Greek letters. So we have alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and you can see the specific details. Those are the four variants of concern. And then we have variants of interest, where we see it moving through a population, maybe with a little more speed than you might see from other variants, and there's some hint that there might be something related to transmission, increased transmission associated with this, or, or maybe it escapes some of our immune responses. We have two of those right now, lambda and mu. So when you hear about all these new variants that are horrible, these double mutant, double delta variants, the reality is most of them are more appropriately termed scariants. They're put out by the media to say, oh, something bad is happening, but they haven't made it onto the scientific list of things that we need to pay attention to. So Lambda and Mu, Mu are the two that we're watching. They haven't crossed the threshold with enough data that would say we need to add them to variants of concern. And then we have that third category, which is variant under monitoring. And these are just variants that we are watching closely, just observing. And you can see that some of these, the ones that I've noted here, 
have been downgraded from variants um, of interest to variants under monitoring because we've learned more about them. We've seen the frequency drop drastically in the population. They aren't really things that we're concerned about anymore. And of course, the key variant that is on everyone's mind is Delta. And what is it about Delta that causes the increased transmission and the escape from, um, from some of our immunity? Here are alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. This is a, a, um, a, each line represents the RNA genome from one end to the other. We're specifically looking at the specific piece of the spike protein gene. And each one of these little boxes or X's represents a specific location in this region of the spike protein gene where we have DNA changes in each of these variants. Early on in the pandemic, we had a specific change at amino acid position 614 that was rapidly, rapidly made its way into all variants. So all variants contain this. It uh, increases the ability of the virus to enter into cells. We have another variant that was found in alpha, beta, and gamma that does the similar thing. And then we have these variants outlined in green that allow the virus to partially evade immunity, either immunity because you've already been infected and you have natural immunity, or immunity from the, um, from the vaccine. That doesn't mean you have no immunity, it just means that you have less. In general, you have lower, um, there are fewer neutralizing antibodies that can actually bind. You still make neutralizing antibodies, but fewer of them are able to bind and inactivate these specific versions. And then there's an additional variant, which is also found in Delta, that increases infectivity, which is part of why you see so many more copies of the Delta variant in individuals that get infected with that version of the virus. There's a lot going on on this screen, but I just want you to focus on the patterns of colors. Each one of these bars is a two-week window across the United States sampling the type of variants that are identified um, across individuals that tested positive for SARS-CoV-2. And you can see the size of that position on the bar graph for that two-week window tells you how prevalent it was in the population at that window in time. So you can watch this kind of khaki color here. Uh, maybe it's cantaloupe colored. Uh, this is the alpha variant. And you can see how beginning in early January, at the end of January, it was, it was not present in America much at all. But over the spring, it really became the predominant version of the virus in the United States, just like it had done in England and in other parts of Europe earlier in the winter. But then, starting in late April, you began to see the Delta variant appear in the United States, and it's now actually completely taken over. There are almost no non-Delta variants in the United States right now. Delta has become dominant in every single way. So even though we're still watching alpha, beta, gamma, and uh, lambda and mu, delta is the key player right now. And there doesn't seem to be anything right now on the horizon to knock it off the throne. Now that doesn't mean that we won't have new variants that appear. We should expect that the mutation, the virus is gonna continue to acquire new mutations. But what the next variant is, and if it's going to be more transmissible, more contagious than Delta, still remains to be seen. All right, let's pause there. That was a whole lot of content about testing and about sequencing and treatment and variants. So let's see what questions you might have. How does the body's normal immunity affect the initial infection. Uh, so we have a set of innate immune responses that typically rec recognize when we have invaders and uh, signal the body's other immune responses that something is here that isn't supposed to be here. We, have some, we know that there are some individuals 
whose innate immune system, that first line defense, doesn't work as well. They have a set of genetic mutations that blunt that response. And these individuals actually get more ill because their body doesn't catch on that there's an infection until later in the process. So they do, they do their job of initial alerting the system, but they aren't very specific and they can be quickly overwhelmed. If I had questions about the third booster, would getting an antibody test verify whether I should get a booster shot? And is there a way to look at T cell levels or helper cells? That's a great question from Peter. One of the challenges, and you'll hear me say this a little bit later, is that right now we don't have a good, what's called correlate of protection. In other words, we don't have a good test where we can say, if you measure this thing, this antibody, this protein, this T cell response, we're gonna be able to tell you if you have a strong enough immune response that you would be fine if you got infected and you could mount a strong response. We don't have a good correlate of protection. Antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, are probably our best bet. But just a simple, straightforward antibody test isn't gonna tell you that. It will tell you if you've got antibodies um, against the virus, but it won't tell you if it's the right kind of antibodies. And Peter, you've also brought up the T cell response. So your antibodies are the, the you know, you've got your, the, the front line, the innate response that I talked about just a minute ago. Then you've got the antibodies. They're the next line and they're very specific. They bind specific sequences on the outside surface of the virus and they try to inactivate it. And then you've got your T cells that come along a little bit later and they destroy cells that have been infected. They recognize cells that have been infected, kill them, and help other parts of the immune system to do their job. We don't have a good set of tests to tell you what your T cell response is. So frustratingly, we don't have a good way to say, yes, you are, you've got a strong immune response. No, your immune response is not. There's a lot of work going into trying to find those correlates of protection, and we need them desperately. All right, those were all great questions. So let's move on. Let's now talk about vaccines, and we'll talk about uh, waning immunity, and then we'll talk about boosters, and that'll wrap us up for the night. Vaccines are one of the key ways that we provide immunity to people without them having to get infected. A vaccine simply stimulates your body's immune system to mount an immune response against a piece of the virus, against, uh, against um, an inactivated virus, against a protein from the virus. So your body is primed to recognize that as an invader. So when you do encounter the virus, when you do get exposed, your body's immune system is already able to respond and quickly shut down the infection before it even takes hold or before it moves too far uh, into serious illness. That's the concept behind vaccines. There are over a hundred vaccine candidates currently um, in the pipeline, which is amazing. And you may say, well, we've already got three here in the United States. Why do we need more vaccines? Each generation of vaccine gets a little bit better, does a little bit more. And there are vaccines that are currently in clinical trials that do things that our current set of vaccines don't necessarily do. Plus, with all of the, the billions of people in the world, we don't have enough of our current vaccines to vaccinate everyone. So we've got to have additional vaccines brought to the table. This is the vaccine tracker from the New York Times. You can go to it, it's not behind a paywall, and it tells you the different phases of the clinical trial process, and then it walks you through each of the different vaccines. Here are some of the, the key leaders. You'll recognize some of these like Pfizer and Moderna, the Oxford AstraZeneca that's available in Europe, Johnson and Johnson. In the United States, there are three key vaccines that have received either emergency use authorization, meaning that they are able to be used in an emergency like a pandemic. They've gone through a set of, of clinical trials and safety testing, or they've received full FDA approval, which means they've provided additional evidence, longer term evidence showing, um, showing that they're safe and showing that they're effective. 
but whether they have emergency use authorization, EUA, or full FDA approval, they're available for use in the United States. Pfizer BioNTech, um, that vaccine now has trade named um, Community. I'm not sure that anybody will actually remember that, but that's the, the name of the vaccine now. It's an mRNA vaccine. It provides a set of instructions um, to make a part of the spike protein. It doesn't make a live virus, it doesn't make an active virus, but it's injected into your cells and your cells read the mRNA instructions and make the protein and put it on the outside of the cell. And then your immune system goes, I've not seen this before, and builds an immune response against it. Two doses, 21 days apart. It's the only one in America that's received full FDA approval, and it's been approved for individuals 16 and above for full approval. It still has emergency use authorization for individuals 12 to 15 years old. In August, the FDA approved a third dose for individuals that have certain immunocompromised states, like they've had a solid organ transplant or they're on immunosuppressant medication. Because we know individuals that have a suppressed immune response can't make the response to the vaccine as strong as you would like. And that third dose seems to boost the level of neutralizing antibodies up to the level of where you would expect it for individuals that aren't immunocompromised. And then earlier this month, Pfizer shared data on their clinical trial looking at children five through 11. And that is expected to come to the FDA for a decision about whether they'll accept it as emergency use authorization and be able to offer that to children. Uh, data on kids under the age of five will probably appear late this fall uh, or early this winter. The second vaccine is also an mRNA vaccine. That's by Moderna. Their trade name is actually pretty cool, Spikevax. I like Spikevax. Um, also mRNA, two doses. In this case, it's 28 days apart, so there's an extra week. Three weeks apart, four weeks apart. They have emergency use authorization for individuals 18 and above. They've, been, they've applied to the FDA to expand that to a younger audience. The FDA hasn't voted on that yet. And also in August, the FDA approved them for a third dose for immunocompromised. And then Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson is a slightly different one. It's not an mRNA, it's an adenovirus. So they take a cold virus and they inactivate it so it can infect cells, but it can't make more copies of itself. And it injects a set of instructions, again, that makes a copy of the spike protein. So same concept, just a different delivery vehicle. This is a one dose vaccine. You only need one dose and then you're done. Uh, it has emergency use authorization also for individuals 18 and above. And just a couple weeks ago, actually just a week ago, Johnson & Johnson shared data on a clinical trial looking at the impact of a second dose. And they found that giving people a second dose, not surprisingly, boosts the level of neutralizing antibodies. So it'll remain to be seen if the FDA shifts from a one dose to a two dose regimen. Um, and also, the FDA just last week for Pfizer approved a third dose, a booster dose for older adults. And we'll talk about that booster dose in just a second. Here in the United States, over 182 million people have been vaccinated. You can see about almost 100 million of those are Pfizer. Another 68 million are Moderna. And about 14 and a half, 15 million are Johnson & Johnson. So you can see that the mRNA vaccines are the key drivers here in the United States. If you went to Europe or other countries, you would see uh, more maybe of the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca, which is an adenovirus like Johnson & Johnson, or you might see uh, um, uh, inactivated um, or weakened SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, which is what some of the other countries have brought to market as well. There are a set of common side effects that are not that different from any other vaccine that you might get. Things like swelling or redness at the injection site, fatigue, headache, muscle ache, chills. These generally come on within a day of getting the uh, first or the second or just the first dose, and they generally go away within about 24 hours. They're, they're inconvenient. Um, for some people, it shuts them down for a day or so, but they pass. They're more, for many people, minor nuisances. There are a set of side effects that are rare, but are serious and significantly 
serious. And I've listed those here. Anaphylaxis, this is an individual who has a strong allergic reaction to some component of the vaccine. And in this individual, that allergic reaction shuts off, closes off their breathing passages. This is why you have to wait for 15 minutes when you go to get a vaccine so that you can be monitored in case you have anaphylaxis, if you go into anaphylaxis. And an EpiPen is usually something that, that's available on site that helps, um, that, that helps treat this. About five out of every million doses, regardless of the vaccine type, deal with anaphylaxis. I'm gonna show you these numbers, they're low. That doesn't mean they're trivial, that doesn't mean they aren't important if it happens to you, but I want us to put this in context. We tend to hear a lot about these when it first comes out, but we don't stop to look at what the numbers are and to think that this is way less than one in a thousand, um, one in a hundred thousand in many cases. We've seen uh, myocarditis, inflammation of the heart, especially in young men um, that have gotten the mRNA vaccines. This is about 13 out of every million doses. Uh, generally, this resolves on its own. Uh, you can take an anti-inflammatory in a lot of cases. Um, there are a few cases that have required hospitalizations, but, but this is something, again, we know what to look for. We know how to treat it. You may have heard about this very unusual type of blood clot, these clots that formed in large vessels or formed in the brain from individuals, especially young women, after they got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine. Overall, this is about three out of every million doses, but it could be as high as, um, you know, one in a hundred thousand for young women uh, which is why, in a lot of cases, physicians recommend that young women stay away from the Johnson & Johnson. Different groups look at different ways. The benefit, obviously, of Johnson & Johnson is it's one shot, and, and, and then you're done, and you've got a significant amount of protection. But this is a, an important side effect to be aware of. And then Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an autoimmune disorder that, that's called, um, it, it involves a, um, muscle weakness and, and temporary paralysis. Uh, about 14 per million doses. Again, really, really rare, but certainly not a trivial side effect if it happens to you. This is often found in individuals that have had a previous instance of Guillain-Barre. Um, it is more common among older men, although certainly you do see it periodically uh, among women. So I don't want to downplay the side effects. There are a handful of rare but serious side effects. But in general, most individuals that get vaccinated have these common ones that disappear within about 24 hours. Now let's talk about vaccine effectiveness because this is something that we've heard a lot of people talk about, but they're really sloppy with their language. And that includes a lot of scientists and physicians as well. Vaccine effectiveness means that in a vaccinated population, X percent fewer people will something when they come into contact with the virus. Now, those, what, what does that fill in the blank? This is not a Mad Libs for those of you that are old enough to remember what those are. But when we talk about immunity and the effectiveness of the vaccine, we can talk about it with relation to a lot of different things. Am I talking about immunity, protection from getting infected at all? Am I talking about protection from developing symptomatic illness or having serious illness that requires you to go to the hospital or be put on a ventilator? Or am I talking about that the vaccine protects you from death? The vaccines provide some level of protection for each one of those, but it's important to know what we are talking about when we talk about vaccine effectiveness. So for example, if we were to say it's 93% effective against hospitalization, that doesn't mean that it works 93% of the time or it works in 93% of the people that get vaccinated. It means that in a population of people that have been vaccinated, 93% fewer people will be hospitalized if they come into contact with the virus. That's what effectiveness means, and I don't think we talk about that enough. So over the next set of slides, I'm gonna show you what we know about vaccine effectiveness for the vaccines here in America. This is all data that's been taken from the presentations that were given to the CDC and the FDA in the last couple of weeks as we think about the concepts around boosters. So I've got a reference for them down at the bottom. You can go and get additional information. You can find these online. 
It's important to note that a lot of the vaccine effectiveness studies that you are seeing reported are being reported on what we're gonna call real world data. But the challenge around real world data is that there are a lot of factors that influence that, like what variant are we looking at in a population? What's the human behavior? Are people that have gotten vaccinated more likely to go out in crowds unmasked or are they more likely to stay inside and, and be away from individuals? Um, what, how many other people have been infected? How many people have natural immunity because they have been infected in the past versus being vaccinated? So it's difficult to compare study versus study because they're using slightly different populations. So that's where it gets really tricky to say, well, we're gonna rely all on the data that comes out of this country or comes out of this location or uses this vaccine. Now let's look at vaccine effectiveness against infection. So this is saying, how well does the vaccine protect you from getting infected if you come into contact with the virus? And early on, early this year, these vaccines looked like superpower vaccines. When they were in clinical trials, they were developed to provide protection against hospitalization, serious illness, and death to reduce the burden on the healthcare system, to keep it from, from collapsing under so many cases, to reduce the number of people that die. That's what they were developed for. But we found that they were incredibly effective against any kind of infection. And you were seeing data in the 95%, 90% effectiveness against infection. It was incredible. And then came Delta, and Delta changed some of that. So each one of these lines is a different research study looking at the effectiveness in different months. And in general, you can see that there is a reduction in effectiveness against infection. Now, that doesn't plummet all the way to zero. In some cases, it's 50, 60, 70%. So the vaccines still provide protection, but they are providing less protection against infection. Let's look at protection effectiveness against symptomatic infection. So I know that I don't feel well. I have a set of symptoms that take me to my doctor. The top line, the top set of graphs are um, effectiveness with the Pfizer vaccine, community. The bottom set of graphs are with Moderna's spike vax. I just wanted to say spike vax because I like the way that sounds. That might be a great spike vax. That sounds like a Halloween costume, but anyway, sorry. Uh, each one of these is looking at the effectiveness against symptomatic infection by age. So this is uh, 20 to 44 year olds, 45 to 54 year olds, individuals 55 to 64, and then this is looking at it overall. And then the same breakdowns uh, with Moderna. The green lines represent the effectiveness against symptomatic, symptomatic infection in the time before Delta was prevalent. The red lines represent the protection and symptomatic infection when Delta was prevalent. And you can see the red lines start out at a lower place than the green lines. So there's less protection against Delta. Still serious protection, but that protection drops over time. So there is a waning immunity against symptomatic infection. And that waning immunity seems to be happening across multiple different years. Now again, those numbers are still high, 76, 66% effective, but there is a drop over time, in part because of Delta, but in part because as we get further out from when we've been vaccinated, the level of antibodies in our blood drops. This is a natural part of your immune response. It would be a bad thing if everything you've ever been exposed to, you are walking around carrying incredibly high levels of antibodies against. After the infection, after the vaccination, those levels are high for a period of time and then they drop. And that dropping immunity means that we are more susceptible to infection. But if we get infected, those antibody levels go up, the T cells come in, and you prevent, in most cases, progression to serious illness. Most, but not all cases. Now let's look at the effectiveness against hospitalization. This is where you've, you may have been infected, you may have developed symptoms, but that immune response has kicked in from getting the vaccine. 
And again, the blue lines are the mRNA vaccines for uh, individuals that are 16 and above. The, the orange and yellow lines are looking at the mRNA vaccines in the older population, 50 above, and the Janssen and the Johnson and Johnson or the Janssen, um, which is a, which was a co-manufacturer, is in red. In general, you see those lines are pretty consistent. There's pretty solid protection against hospitalization, even out uh, out into that six month plus window. What about effectiveness against individuals? Effectiveness against hospitalization for individuals that have comorbidities, those issues like hypertension and obesity and diabetes. So if you have no underlying conditions, this is before Delta and this is in the middle of Delta, vaccine effectiveness seems to be pretty consistent. It's lower for individuals with more than one underlying condition and it drops a little bit in each case with the advent of Delta. So, Delta is partly responsible, but not wholly responsible for this waning immunity, this drop in vaccine effectiveness. But still, those graphs are really high for effectiveness against hospitalization. Here's a summary of the vaccine efficacy, vaccine effectiveness data in the Delta window, which is what we're really interested in because Alpha is not with us in large numbers anymore, Delta is. So that's what we want to know. Remember I told you different studies look at different things, different age groups, different populations, different windows in time. So you're seeing a scattering of data from these different studies. So don't focus on any one study, look at your overall pattern. This is the data from Pfizer, from Moderna, and from the Janssen, the Johnson & Johnson. The red dots indicate vaccine effectiveness against hospitalization and severe disease. The blue dots indicate vaccine effectiveness against um, infection or symptomatic infection. And as we've said, the blue dots in general are lower, so there's less effectiveness, but we're still talking about, you know, 50% or above, and in some cases quite high. And then we have high levels of protection against serious illness. So the vaccines are doing what they were designed to do, but as our antibody levels drop, it puts us at a higher susceptibility of developing some kind of infection, some kind of symptomatic infection. You've probably seen this data showing the level, the degree of protection against infection, hospitalization, and death from individuals that are infected. You and I both know people who have been vaccinated, who've gotten infected, who've had breakthrough infections. You and I both know some folks that have even been to the hospital because they're, uh, they've had a breakthrough infection that has caused them to be really ill, and some that have, have died. Vaccines are not foolproof, but there's a much higher level of protection than individuals that haven't been vaccinated. Now, this brings a question a great question that I'm often asked, what about people that don't get vaccinated, but they've had COVID prior? What kind of um, native immunity, natural immunity do they have? So the data are telling us that prior infection gives you significant and lasting protection. So if you've been infected in the past, there is a level of strong immunity that you've got. But here's the challenge. Not everyone with a prior infection has a strong immune response. And as you heard in my answer to Peter's question a little bit earlier in, in this session, we don't have a good way to measure correlates of protection. So just because you've been infected before, and let's say you've even gone and gotten an antibody test that says you're making antibodies, that doesn't tell us if you're making a strong immune response or not. So even though in general, people produce a strong immune response, there's a significant number of individuals that produce a very weak or no immune response. And there's no way for us to know that ahead of time. So that's why the recommendation is for these individuals who've had COVID in the past to go on ahead and to get vaccinated. And prior infection plus a vaccine dose makes you super immune. It gives you a higher level of immunity than any other uh, category of individuals. There's some data that suggests people may only need one dose of a two dose regimen if they've had prior COVID. Um, we don't have enough data to really definitively yet say that's definitely the case. So this is the challenge. And just like with vaccine-induced immunity, 
we see that native immunity, natural immunity, also drops over time. So you can see in certain cases, people that have been, uh, that, that have been infected six months later can get reinfected. So that's why the recommendation is uh, people with prior infection also think about getting vaccinated. What we really need, I'll say this for like the sixth time, is a way to determine correlative protection. Because then we could take anybody, whether you've had COVID in the past or you've been vaccinated in the past, and we could say, you've got a really strong immune response. And let's track that in three months and then in six months and in nine months so that when it begins to wane, we can talk about what we need to do to try to boost those levels again. And that brings us to our conversation about boosters. So these lines are showing you the frequent, the incidence among vaccinated people for hospitalizations looking at that in May, in June, and July. And you can see here at the end of July and moving into August, there was an increase in the number of vaccinated people that were hospitalized here in the United States. Now, on top of that, I'm showing you in this box data from Israel. Israel vaccinated a significant portion of their population, about 67, 70% very early, and they used Pfizer. Everybody got Pfizer, or almost everybody in Israel that got vaccinated got Pfizer. And they found that in July, when they looked at people who had been hospitalized with COVID, who had been vaccinated, they found that there was a lower incidence of people that had been vaccinated relatively recently in like April and May. But then in March and February and January, the further you got from your vaccination date, the higher the incidence of people in the hospital were. That's what triggered in Israel the decision to offer boosters to initially to older individuals and then to everybody. And the idea being that if I give you a booster dose, it's the exact same vaccine that you got in your first or your second dose with Pfizer or with Moderna, I'm giving you another dose, I am priming your immune system, I am raising up that level of neutralizing antibodies. So those antibody levels that are dropping over time, I'm boosting them back up. There are a number of vaccines like hepatitis that are a three vaccine system. So it might be that COVID-19 requires a three vaccine series, or it might not. But this was what was driving a lot of the decisions in Israel around boosters. Here in the United States, the issue, one of the issues around booster is, the, is weighing the benefit of giving the booster versus the potential rare side effects that we talked about from the vaccines. The estimate is that you would need to give almost 500 booster doses to individuals over the age of 65 to prevent one person from being hospitalized six months out from their, from their last dose. So one out of every 500 gives you a benefit. That's a pretty, that's a pretty realistic, a pretty uh, significant argument for giving boosters to an older population but you would need to give almost 9,000 boosters for a younger population before you would prevent one individual from being hospitalized. Again, COVID-19, the primary risk factor is older age. The risk of death from COVID-19 doubles with about every five to eight years of life that you're looking at. So we're talking about how do we help protect people that are older that have weaker immune systems to begin with, because the older we get, the weaker our immune system becomes, who are potentially dealing with dropping antibody levels um, and running the risk of getting infected and symptomatic. And in an older individual, getting symptoms can be problematic even if you've been vaccinated. So that's why the push for boosters comes into play. This is looking at people that are 65 and older and the type of vaccine they got, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, and when they got it. So 27 million individuals got their second dose, or if it was Johnson & Johnson, got their first dose by the 27th of March. So that's six months from yesterday. So you've got a significant number of people that have already been, that are at that six month window. That's the group that is currently eligible for boosters. All right, we're in the home stretch, guys. If you've got a set of questions, get ready to ask them. I know we're running up against our time, but we had a lot of ground to cover. So in the United States, the, uh, the FDA and the CDC have set this policy for boosters as of the 27th. 
Individuals who received their second Pfizer dose six months ago and are 65 or older are now eligible for a booster. Individuals who received their second Pfizer dose six months ago and are 50 to 64 and have underlying medical conditions, the ones that I've listed here, for example, are also eligible to get the booster. And individuals that have received their second Pfizer dose six months ago and are younger or any age, but they are high risk because they are healthcare workers or they're teachers or they work in daycare or in nursing homes or grocery stores or, or they're in homeless shelters or prisons. People who are likely to come into contact with exposure, they're also now eligible for that booster dose. What about people that got Moderna or that got Johnson & Johnson? So we're still in limbo. I think over the next few weeks, we'll see rulings on booster doses, a third the equivalent of a third dose for Moderna, a second dose for Johnson & Johnson over the next few weeks. This is just showing you the level of antibodies specific to the binding region of the spike protein or any region of the spike protein. Moderna has a slightly higher level of antibodies than Pfizer, and both of them have a higher level of antibodies than Johnson & Johnson. And that's not so surprising, one dose versus two doses. But if you've gotten Moderna, or if you've gotten Johnson & Johnson and you're waiting on information for boosters, that data should be coming within the next few weeks. So what happens now? We're beginning to move down from the Delta wave. What should we expect going forward? This is a great article from Stat News. It's not behind a paywall, so you can take a look at it. Winter is coming again. What should we expect? And we should expect that there are going to be continued peaks and valleys as we rise, as the incidents in our communities rise and as it drops. A lot of people think that we are past our last great big wave, that that's the delta wave we've just gone through. But that's, of course, pending the arrival of no new major variants that are more infectious or evade the immune system better than delta. And that's a little bit of an unknown. I think for all of us, our crystal balls are broken or at least uh, seriously fogged over. So we want to be really careful and take a healthy dose of humility before we make a whole lot of grand predictions. We should expect to see vaccinations become available for children, although what that uptake will be, how many parents will get their kids vaccinated, is really an open question. And then human behavior is key. What are those, do we all run into crowds of people and resume life prior to March of 2020 um, without any of those additional protections, whether that's masking, distancing, lots of at-home testing being done on a regular basis or vaccination. What will our impact, what will our, how, are all, how will our behavior impact this? We've talked about additional variants. And then how long does immunity last? Does it continue to wane when we get a booster? Does that keep levels at a high, uh, does that keep antibodies at a high level for a long period of time? Or will that wane? Those are the unknown questions. I'll leave you with a piece of uh, positive news. The groups that model this, that look at lots of data and make recommendations around what they think are gonna happen, uh, came out with their prediction last week. And you can see this was the, here is the historical data on um, new cases per day uh, with the seven day average. And they actually believe that the numbers are gonna drop. Now it's a little hard to see on this picture, but on your image, there's a kind of gray or a taupe uh, shaded area around it. That's the range of uncertainty. It doesn't give me a whole lot of hope that that range of uncertainty goes really high, but in general, the thinking is that the dose, that the number of new cases is going to continue to drop and it's going to stay low provided we don't run into a brand new variant that escapes our existing systems. So I think that is something for us definitely to, to look towards, to, to be hopeful for. We'll gather more types of data and therapeutics, we'll gather more information. COVID-19 will probably never go away. It will always be with us at some level, and it might rise and fall uh, as we move into winter, just like we see uh, influenza. Um, that becomes something that we learn to live with and we adjust around rather than something that brings us to our knees. All right, 
Last opportunity to ask questions now that we've just gone through a whole dose of COVID-19 content. All right. Doesn't look like anybody has asked any additional questions. So with that, thank you for watching this series, this Biotech 101. This is the first time we've done this virtually. And I know many of you watch live and a significant number, almost the same number of you watch later on. So you watch it at some point during the days after. Thank you for being curious about how biotechnology and genetics works. Thank you for asking questions, for exploring the data and, and, and seeking to understand science. It's a pleasure to be able to offer these kinds of programs, and I'm grateful to Hudson Alpha and to our sponsors for allowing us to bring this to you. It looks like I might have one more question. The potential approval of a vaccine for individuals under the age of 12. I think it is very likely that within the next four weeks, we will see approval of the Pfizer vaccine for individuals five to 11. Uh, those numbers, I think they are, they're large. They are not as large as the clinical trials that we've seen, uh, that we saw for, for the Pfizer earlier data, but that was for a much broader age range. But I do think we're likely to see approval for that probably right around or right before uh, the end of October. And with that, I will close out this session. Thank you for watching. Take care. I look forward to seeing you again on another Hudson Alpha educational program. Bye, everybody.